Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the September 2018 Mississippi PowerShell User Group Meeting. Tonight we've got Mark Krause, who's presenting on concurrent programming in PowerShell with a producer consumer pattern. Take it away, Mark. Thanks, Mike. So, as Mike said, the topic for tonight is concurrent programming in PowerShell with a producer consumer pattern. So what I'm going to go over is first, I'm going to introduce myself briefly. Um, then I'm going to go over what concurrent programming is. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on the different ways you can do pro concurrent programming in PowerShell. Then I'm going to get into the main focus, which is what is the producer consumer pattern, and then a demo of how you can do this inside of PowerShell. So first of all, who am I? I'm a senior systems administrator. I'm sorry, senior systems engineer at LinkedIn. Just recently started there. I'm a PowerShell core project collaborator. I am a contributor on the web commandlets, uh, primarily there. Um, I'm the author of the Git PowerShell blog and the co-author of one of many for the PowerShell conference book. So what is concurrent programming? Um, or concurrent computing, as Wikipedia would have it. Uh, it's a form of computing in which several computations are executed during overlapping time periods concurrently instead of sequentially, one completing before the next starts. So running multiple things at one time, basically. Um, so when I first uh, came to scripting a long time ago, um, I was you know, presented with uh, parallel uh, coding in uh, Perl. So that's something that was very commonly done, and it was always called parallel uh, coding, and I was like, okay, that's the word for running two things at once, basically. Uh, at the PowerShell Summit, when uh, Joey was going into, that they were going to be adding some concurrent programming into PowerShell, and he said that, yes, it is concurrent and not parallel, I had to go and look what is the difference between concurrent and parallel, because I didn't really know the difference. And since I come from an ops background, and I think most PowerShell users are, I think that since I had to learn this, you might need to too, so I might as well just cover this briefly. So there's three kinds of modes. Um, there's serial, concurrent, and parallel. Um, before I get into what those are, I want to cover some terms that I'm going to use so that you kind of understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to say core, and by that I mean a CPU. Um, that used to mean like a single CPU physically in a system, but today that can mean a, one core within a physical CPU and a multi-core processor. So when I talk about a core, I'm talking about a single processing unit as a physical uh, processing unit. A thread is a virtual CPU that runs on the core. So this is a way that a, a processor runs multiple things at once on a single core. Um, and then a task, is code that runs inside of a thread. So for our purposes, that's basically a script block in PowerShell. Um, so what's serial then is, is a task completing one after the other. Task A runs, then task B runs. Task one runs, task two runs. There's never any overlap. One task has to complete before the next can start. Um, it uses a single thread and it runs on a single core because there's no need for multiple cores for this kind of thing. It's just running one task after the other. Um, this is technically slow um, because you have to wait for one task to finish before another completes. So if you're doing like 500 users being added to Active Directory, that is really slow if you're gonna do one after the other. Whereas if you could do all 500 at once, you would be doing that a lot faster. Um, so, that kind of makes sense, but what's the difference between parallel and concurrent? Um, so parallel is using a single core per task. So a single CPU core is dedicated to a single task. That uh, core is not running any other tasks, and you can run multiple tasks on multiple cores at once. Um, this is not possible on a single core system. So in the old days when you had a single phys physical processor that was a single core processor, Parallel processing on that system was not possible. It was all concurrent um, multi-threading. Uh, so this is faster because you can run multiple tasks at once. And if you think about it as like a car and a freeway, so a CPU being a freeway, uh, and you've got a single freeway per car, I mean, you get to work really fast. There's no traffic to worry about because there's no other cars on that. That freeway is dedicated to you. 
very fast, but expensive. If we had to build a freeway for every car, that takes a lot of land and that's really expensive. So really fast, but expensive. So what's concurrent then? Concurrent is based on threads. And threads can run on a single CPU. They can run on multiple cores. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the key there is that you can share a single core with multiple tasks running at the same time. And the core will schedule when these uh, threads are running and what amount of time they get on that core to actually do their processing. So this is slightly slower than parallel processing, but it's cheaper. So this is like having a wide freeway and multiple cars on that freeway. Sometimes you get only one car in that freeway and it goes really fast. Sometimes you get three and that's enough lanes on that freeway and it goes, but sometimes you get a massive amount like Bay Area traffic and you're waiting five hours to go two miles. Um, so that's kind of the differences between parallel, serial, and concurrent. So in PowerShell, you have several ways to do concurrency. And I'm, using, I'm going to use concurrency instead of parallel because some of these could be parallel, but you're always going to be right with concurrence, whereas parallel, you're talking specifically about one task per core, so you're not always right there. So I wanted, I originally did this uh, presentation several times, and I include some examples of this in the presentation material. I'm not going to cover it here because I want to focus more on the producer-consumer pattern and not on how you do concurrent programming in general in PowerShell, but you have some options. You have PowerShell jobs, and that's like start job, stop job. It's usually the first thing you run into in PowerShell when you're doing multiple tasks at once. Um, the next is posh RS, RS jobs, which is Bo Prox's community module, which is phenomenal. It's great. Um, and it's usually the second thing you run into when you're looking at how to do things better and faster at, at a single time. Then there's the PS thread job module, which is a PowerShell team member um, wrote this, and if it hasn't already, it's going to be added into PowerShell Core. I'm a little behind having been relocating and busy with that, so it might already be in for the next version of PowerShell Core, and I haven't kept up with the uh, words on that, but it uses start thread job, and then it uses the same kind of commands as PowerShell jobs. And then there's run spaces, which is built into the PowerShell API in .NET, that uh, is behind the scenes running for a lot of things you do in PowerShell. And Posh RS jobs and PS thread jobs are actually abstractions on top of PowerShell run spaces anyways, but it is a very raw way that you can do some parallel or concurrent processing in PowerShell. And I use that here in this presentation um, just because it is the most uh, flexible way of doing it, but it is very, uh, rough. It, it requires a lot of boilerplate code to make work, um, and that's why people have written uh, their own abstractions for it. So now to get into the main topics here, the producer-consumer pattern. Um, so first of all, what is a producer-consumer pattern? So if you know the words uh, producer and consumer, you can kind of figure this out. So a producer creates or produces items, and a consumer uses or consumes items from a producer. The PowerShell pipeline itself is a producer-consumer, believe it or not. So you use this all the time, and you don't even realize it, or maybe you have. Um, Git job produces a job object that is then passed into wait job, which consumes the job that Git job produces. But something can be both a producer and a consumer at once, like wait job. It both consumes the job produced by get job and produces a job that is then consumed by receive job. So if you think about this like a real world, world product, you've got people who make things like Nike and people who consume things like people who buy Nike shoes. Um, so producer consumer pattern is, is common in a lot of things. Um, but what does this have to do with concurrent programming? So in concurrent programming, uh, you'll often find that you'll need to do things with multiple producers of the same kind of item. As an example, a previous employer of mine was a company who grew through acquisition. So we had multiple HR systems. HR systems are usually what trigger your creation of Active Directory users. So having multiple things that produce what you're going to consume as Active Directory 
users to put into Active Directory, um, those are multiple producers. Sometimes you have multiple consumers of the same item. So let's say that you also had multiple Active Directories you have to add in or multiple forests that you have to add a new user in. So now you've got multiple HR systems that are creating multiple new employees that need to be created as new users in multiple ADs. So you've got multiple consumers as well. So if you think of producers and consumers as threads instead of discrete objects, then you have multiple threads running. And in PowerShell for us, we're gonna think of a thread as script blocks. And the cool thing about the producer consumer pattern is that you can increase and decrease the number of producers and consumers and really throttle your entire throughput based on what your exact needs are. So that's a pretty abstract thing to talk about. I wanna bring this back into the concrete so that we can uh, have something more physical to think of to apply coding to. So I'm gonna talk about the widget factory really quick. This is a fictional factory that takes in monads and then turns them into widgets and ships them out. So there's three basic floors to the widget factory. There's the receiving floor, the manufacturing floor, and the shipping floor. And we'll start off with the receiving floor. Basically there, they've got a bunch of bays for trucks to pull up and deliver monads. So there's a bunch of dock workers that sit there and take the monads off of the delivery trucks. And they take those monads and they put them on a monad line. If you look back up here, the monad line is just a like a queue. It's, you know, manufacturing line. They just put the monads on the line as they come in. Sometimes there's multiple suppliers coming in at once. So we might have multiple delivery trucks at once. Sometimes all the bays are full. Sometimes only one bay is full. Uh, sometimes we have more delivery trucks than we have dock workers. Sometimes we have plenty of dock workers, but not enough delivery trucks. Um, but all the deliveries then are fed into a single monad line, which goes to the manufacturing floor. On the manufacturing floor, what we have is some line workers that take a monad off of that monad line, that queue of monads, and then they use their magic to turn monads into widgets. I'm not sure of that process myself, but that's what they do. When they're done with the completed widgets, they take that and they put it on the widget line, which goes from the manufacturing floor to the shipping floor. We have multiple line workers that can pull in off the times. Depending on our load, we might have more line workers than we have monads coming in. Sometimes we might have less line workers than we have monads coming in. And we can adjust that by bringing on more staff or letting the staff go home early, all that kind of stuff that you can do. Um, sometimes, though, in a physical world with humans, you have multiple humans who need to go grab a mana at the same time. Now, in that situation, humans can talk to each other. I can say, hey, you go ahead and take this one, I'll grab the next monad. Or, hey, I really need this monad, can you grab the next one? You can work this out pretty easily. Now, computers are stupid. They only do exactly what you tell them. So in that situation, if you have multiple things trying to access another thing in code, you get contention, you get thread locking, you get all kinds of weird things that show up in um, concurrency. So you have to be careful about that. Um, and I'm just putting that in mind for later and we'll, we'll go over how we get around that. So the shipping side then takes the widgets off the widget line and uh, pallets them and then they get put on the trucks for different distributors. So sometimes we have multiple distributors there and we're putting pallets on multiple trucks. Sometimes we have more dock workers than we have delivery trucks. Sometimes we have less dock workers than delivery trucks. Sometimes there's not enough widgets to make a full pallet and we have to wait for some of the widgets. So this kind of uh, processing on human terms is kind of easy to do, but think about it from a computer's terms. You gotta sit there and really tell the computer exactly what to do in those kinds of situations if we were having a computer doing all of this. So stepping back from the physical world into programming, sometimes we need to deal with more than one source of data. Uh, sometimes the amount of data is so great that processing it serially just makes no sense. Like processing 500 users is really slow to do uh, one after the other when you could do multiple at the same time. Sometimes we have multiple consumers of our process data. Sometimes we have multiple ADs that we have to stick new users into. Um, most often this work is broken up into batches. So when you start looking at 
uh, programming for multiple things at the same time in PowerShell, the first pattern that you'll run into is batch processing. And often what you'll find done is that they'll have 500 users and they see that I've got five cores on my system. So I'm gonna divide the 500 users by five, so that's five batches of 100. And I'm gonna give 100 users to one process to, to run through, 100 users for another process to run through, and so on. And that's great, and it's, a, it's an easy, quick way of doing things, requires a lot less programming overhead, but what happens when the first one finishes, all 100 users, but the second one's still on user three? So that means that users 94 uh, through 97 and 4 through 100 on that thread are just sitting there waiting to be done when you've got this empty thread doing nothing. Um, so batches are kind of leading to underutilized threads. And just like management in any company, we want all our workers 100% utilized at all times unless there's no work to be done. So to make that kind of happen in um, programming, we can use the consumer-producer-consumer producer, uh, producer pattern. So to get into a real-world programming example of this, uh, I had at a previous employer, hybrid exchange environment with on-prem and Office 365 mailboxes in both. They, we needed to enumerate all the mailboxes in both environments, get all the inbox rules, which is a very slow and expensive task. Um, and this required multiple service accounts to get all of these rules. And service accounts have a problem in Office 365 in that you can't open too many PowerShell sessions per account or you'll get locked out. And sometimes a single account will, for whatever reason, just fail no matter what it's running. So there's some contention issues you have to deal with with dealing this, uh, with actually making this kind of thing work. And there's throttling on per user uh, consideration, so you have to make sure you're doing uh, only a certain number of API calls in a certain amount of time. And uh, at the end of just pulling in all of these uh, rules and uh, getting them from all the mailboxes and dealing with all those API considerations. You then have to process those rules into something that your security people can look at, which was kind of the, the focus of this, was to produce a report of all rules that uh, had delete uh, capabilities in it. Um, and then having login, logging and error detection in all this. Uh, so when I first was presented with this problem, I did it serially where I took in all the mailboxes and then one by one grabbed the rules and then processed them and then logged them, all that kind of stuff, one after the other. And the process was taking two and a half days to run. Um, that's really slow. And I got lucky because the single service account that I was using to do it was not losing its connection to Office 365, which is nearly unheard of. So once I realized this was gonna be a process we had to repeat it, I had to investigate how to do this in some sane manner that didn't involve trying to batch these out and dealing with that. What I came up with was this, which I'm not going to go too much in depth in, but the link is in the presentation materials, and you can find it from my gist if you go gist.github.com forward slash Mark E. Kraus. Um, you can find my Git inbox rules report PS1, and it basically breaks out into several different uh, producer consumers that use different queues to talk between each other to accomplish this. So if you're looking for a real solid world example and not something as simplistic as my demo, you can look this and you can even use it if you're an exchange administrator yourself. Um, but the point is like after taking this and applying the producer consumer pattern to it and parallelizing this and tuning it a little bit, I got a two and a half day process down to two and a half hours. So that's a lot of time saved, a lot of, a lot faster. We were able to make this report run on demand um, in a reasonable amount of time. And believe it or not, the time sync was no longer getting the rules. At the end, it was actually generating the report because CSV is super slow. Um, so I went very quickly over what that just was because I just wanted to show it and talk about it. But there's some secret ingredients involved in how you build the producer-consumer pattern in PowerShell. Um, and I stole these directly from C Sharp. So there is a nice .NET article on how to uh, do producer-consumer patterns in C Sharp using thread-safe collections. 
And the thread safe collections of our concern are the blocking collection. Um, and it's a, it's a blocking collection of PS object, basically, and concurrent queue and concurrent stack. And uh, those are being used between run space pools and PowerShell to talk between different threads. So these are queues and stacks that can be used in multiple PowerShell threads without any of those contention issues I was talking about before, where if two, th two things are trying to talk to the same object at once, it locks up. These prevent that, if you use them the proper way, that is. So as a kind of like code uh, blueprint for how this looks, it's very simple. Um, we're creating a queue uh, that is basically a blocking collection that is using a, a concurrent queue as its backing object. And we create a run space pool, open the pool, we create a PowerShell thread, and we set the run space pool for that PowerShell thread to the pool we create. We add a script to that PowerShell thread, we add an argument to it, and then we do begin invoke. So that's the really basic building blocks of what goes on from what I call the calling thread or the master script. So the secret sauce for how these are talking back and forth then is the blocking collection and specifically the get consuming enumerable method on that. So the get consuming enumerable method is really cool in that it's when you have a thread that's using it, it you use a for each loop to, to call it and it'll sit there and that thread will just sleep automatically until there's something in the queue to, to pull from. And when the queue has been completed, as in you're done adding to it, the for each loop will automatically exit. So this does all of your sleep logic for you. And also, since it's a thread safe collection, you don't have to worry about contention issues. Multiple threads can run the same exact for each loop against the consume against that queue. And you don't have to worry about them locking at all. And they'll automatically get the next one available whenever one is available. So what that looks like is you have basically two threads. One thread is sitting there doing a for each loop, getting a log entry from a log queue that's doing the get consuming enumerable. And then it does stuff on it, whatever you want to do. And then on another thread, you have stuff adding to that queue. So the thread one is your consumer thread and thread two is your producer thread. So thread two is producing things into your queue and thread one is consuming things from the queue. So I mentioned the concurrent stack and in uh, my demo script here, I'm using concurrent stacks mainly for thread tracking. Now, when you get into some advanced concurrent programming uh, methodologies, you usually have some kind of orchestration done to manage all of your running threads, uh, kill threads that have too many errors, start new threads for those that you've killed off, automatically check to see if you need to increase the number of types of, of threads, etc. cetera. Um, but for really simple things, I just want the threads to manage themselves. And so I use a concurrent stack to do this where each thread of a certain kind will add themselves to a stack. And then at the end, they'll look to see if they're the last one in that stack. And if they are, they'll do some cleanup work. Um, and that way I don't have to have a really complex orchestration thread to run this. Um, I just let the threads kind of manage themselves. When you start getting to some actual like error processing and all that kind of stuff, it starts to make sense to actually have an orchestration or a couple orchestration threads doing some management for you. But this works for some very simple means. And that's kind of like what the code looks like there. There's a, a file consumer stack. It just adds itself to the stack and then it does its for each loop and all that kind of stuff. Once the, the queue that it was working on is done, it takes one off the stack. Uh, and then it checks to see if the stack is empty, which is less than one. I just have a weird thing about doing equals zero. I prefer less than one. I've been bit in other languages where sometimes you're expecting zero and you get like 0.5 or minus three instead of zero. So, um, and then it completes the stack itself so that we can clean up the stack later and it completes the queue that it was processing on. So for the demo, um, 
as a kind of diagram of what's going on here, is there's basically going to be multiple folders that have a bunch of files in them. And I'm going to loop through all the folders, and I'm going to get the names of all the files in those folders, and then I'm going to reverse the names on the files and log that. So I'm going to log the old original name and what would be the new name if I revert, reversed it. So this is just a contrived example to show how these threads all work together and how you use queues between them to message, basically. Um, but I'm not actually going to change the actual file names on the system or anything like that. It's just going to log what's, what's doing this. Uh, so the demo code here, um, it starts off with some folders. Uh, I'm creating, I have seven folders created and then a log path where I'm going to log all this that's happening. Uh, the next thing is I'm going to set the number of each type of thread that's running. So we have three types of threads. We have a file producer and we're going to run three of those for starting and then a file consumer, which we're going to run five of. Then we also have a log consumer, which we're only doing one. And uh, we're only doing one because we're writing to a file. And if you ever do anything with multi-threading and files, you'll find out really fast that if you have multiple threads trying to write to the same file, you will end up with all kinds of pain. So since we're doing a, a log to a file on the file system, we're only going to have one thread. But I'm reusing the pattern for this because if later I wanted to change my logger my log consumer to a SQL database instead of a log file, I could reuse the same code and then change what's inside the script block for that to use a SQL thing and then come in here and change the number of consumers because you can write multiple times at once to a database where you can't to a file. So this code for creating the files is something that's just creating the files for this. It's not really part of the consumer conducer producer process. This is data that would already be there. So getting into what the actual file producer is, this is one type of thread. It's the file producer thread. And its responsibility is to get a list of file names from provided folders. So folders come in, in through the folder queue, and then it takes the file names that it enumerates from that folder and puts the file names into the file name queue. It also will send log messages to the log queue for us to send to the log file. And then it also takes in a producer, file producer stack, and that's used to track its brother threads or sister threads to uh, see if it's the last one running and do some cleanup. And then it also takes in a thread name, which it uses for logging purposes and nothing more. So the first thing that the file producer does is it adds itself to the file producer stack. And I'm just using the thread ID. Really, this could be anything. It could be one. It doesn't matter. Uh, I use the thread ID just because it was kind of cool to do that. Um, in the end, it's using the stack count and not the actual stack data to determine if it's the last thread running. So what's in the stack doesn't matter so much as the amount of things in the stack. And then the primary bulk of what the file producer thread is doing is a for each loop on the folder path. So it's going to sit there and look on the folder path, uh, uh, folder queue. It's going to wait for something to come in on that folder queue. It's going to assign it to folder path. And then it's going to enumerate all of the child items in that folder path and add the file name to the file name queue. So this queue is, the file name queue is just going to get the file name from it and it's going to be derived from the folder queue that's passed into it. So it looks very much like a normal function that you would write. The only difference is that instead of doing for each on folder queue being a array of folders or whatever, um, it's doing a folder queue cons get consuming enumerable that is a queue that's being messaged from another thread. And then it's going to log that it found a file name for every file that it finds. Finally, after it's done with the for each loop and all of the queues, all of the folders in the folder queue have been processed, it'll take an item off the file producer stack and then it checks to see if it was the last one in the stack and if it is, 
it completes the file producer stack so we can clean it up later. And it also completes adding the file name queue because all the file producers are done actually adding file names to the queue at this point. So the next thread type is the file consumer. The file consumer takes in the file name queue and it takes in the same log queue that the file producer takes in. And then it takes in a file consumer stack and a thread name that it also uses for logging and nothing more. It too adds itself to a stack when it starts, except it adds itself to the file consumer stack. And then its for each loop is getting the file names from the file name queue and reversing it. So it just takes the chars and reverses them around so that they're backwards. And then it logs the old name and the new name of the file. It's, like I said, it's not actually changing the names of the file, it's just logging what it would do. Once all the file names have been processed, and that would be from all of the folders that were passed in originally, then it will uh, remove itself from the stack. If it's the last one, then it cleans up the consumer, the file consumer stack and cleans up the log queue because all the other threads that are logging are also done. So the other thread type, this is the third of three uh, thread types, is the log consumer. And this one's just a logging thread. Um, I call it a log consumer because it does consume from a log queue, but really you could just call this the logging thread. And it takes in a log path, it takes in a log queue, and it takes in a thread name. And this allows you to log from multiple threads without having to worry about the uh, contention on writing to the file at the same time or anything like that. Since writing to the file is happening from a single thread, then we don't have to worry about those kinds of issues. We don't have to deal with mutexes or anything like that if you know if you know what those are. So it starts out by just logging a message saying that thread has started, uh, the logging thread has started. Um, I'm also using console write line to write that log message uh, to the screen. And the reason why I'm using console uh, write line instead of uh, write host is that since these are running in PowerShell run spaces, write host in a run space doesn't actually write to your console. You can get that information out of the information stream in the more recent versions of PowerShell, but uh, we're not doing that. I want some output on the screen so I can see that it's running. And console write line is a thread safe method. So you can call it from multiple threads if you needed to. Um, but since we're only calling it from one, it's fine here. Um, and then it's, primary work that it does is to look at the log queue. It gets each log entry from the log queue and writes that to the file and also logs it to the screen. When it's done, it writes that it's done logging to the log and that's it. It, it doesn't have to do any a kind of cleanup because it's the only one thread of its kind that it's running. So those are the threads and that's just defining them like a function. So they're script blocks um, that take in parameters and they do some work iterating over a for each loop and uh, do some logging and talking between each other through queues and then managing their uh, sibling threads through the stacks. So to actually start the process of running all these, we first have to create some some queues and some stacks. So we create the folder queue, the file name queue, and the log queue. And then we create the file producer stack and the file consumer stack. And we create a run spaces list. And that's just to track the run spaces. Because unlike some of the other things, when you're doing run spaces manually, you have to track whether they're still running or not. And we'll see that code here. But what we do is we create a run space pool. We open the pool so that all our threads can swim in it. Um, and we kind of repeat this pattern for the different thread types. Um, so for the file producer, uh, we have a file producer pool. Um, it has one to uh, file producer count, which we're starting with three. And it creates three of these basically by doing a for each loop of one to that. Um, it creates the thread name, which is just file producer, and then a zero padded number of the of the current counts that it's on. It creates a run space. 
it signs the run space pool for this particular thread thread type to the run space. And then it adds the script, which is just our file producer script block that we had. And then it adds arguments. Um, there's other ways to do this, but um, I like doing add arguments. It's just a little more clean. Uh, but uh, we're passing in the folder queue, file name queue, log queue, thread name. And if you look back up at the file producer code, it's those parameters that that's being passed in. So the next thing we do is we create a PS custom object that just has the thread name, the PowerShell run space, and the handler that we get when we actually invoke it. So this code right here actually starts the thread. And we basically repeat this pattern for the file consumer thread, except we pass it in the file consumer uh, code block, we uh, script block, and we add in the uh, arguments that that script block cares about. And we repeat the same thing for the log consumer, um, but using the log consumer script block and the arguments that that script block cares about. So at this point, after all the code being run up to line 260, uh, we actually would have threads running and sitting there doing nothing waiting for things to be added to queues to process. So we are basically preceding our environment with threads to actually do work. So to actually start that work, what we have to do is take the list of folders that we defined, the seven folders at the top, and for each of those folders, add them to the folder queue. And once we've done adding all the folders to the folder queue, queue mark it complete. At that point, wow, at that point, the uh, work starts going on in those threads that we started that were sitting there just waiting for things to go into the queue. They start cleaning up after themselves, logging, all that kind of stuff happens. So what we have to do is we just have to sit back and wait for those threads to finish. So we're looking at all the is completed on all the handlers of the run spaces um, and seeing if it still contains false. If there's any false in there, then we sleep for half a second. Uh, so that means that there's still one of the threads running, so we're just going to sleep for a little bit. And then we do some cleanup by going through all the red run spaces, uh, ending the run space, disposing of the run space. Then we dispose of our queues. And then we are doing invoke item on the log pass, so I can pop it up on the screen to show you. So to show you what this looks like then, we just run it. We get a ton of output of all these different tasks being done. And we get a nice log file where we can see file producer three was uh, produced, found this file. Um, well, file producer three was pretty, uh, it was kind of, I can't really zoom in on this, but uh, the uh, gist of it is that we've got different consumer and producer threads producing log entries from that single log thread. Um, they're kind of intermingled. You can see where some files were produced and some were actually worked on, consumed. Um, so it kind of uh, goes back and forth. If you look at the dates, the, the, the times are sometimes out of order in here because the, the action happened and it went into the queue, but the way queuing works and all the threading works, these get out of order. So if we really wanted to make complete sense out of this, we'd have to take the log file at the end and sort it by the actual um, compile times, which is why using a database is somewhat uh, superior to um, file system logging for multi-threading. But that's the, the basics of, of that. But what I mentioned about this and why it's so important and so cool for multi-threading is that we can change a lot of things on this really easily. So if we go back up to the top, you notice that I said that we're going to start with three file producers. Um, that means that we only have three threads that are going through seven folders. So we know up front that we have seven folders. Why don't we just make this seven threads so we can be more efficient and uh, process all the folders at once? All I did was change that, and what I get is the exact same kind of run thing, but a little bit more efficient, where we had seven uh, file producers running at once. And you can see in the log, there's two, there's five, um, there's six. Uh, so we had 
seven threads basically going through the seven folders all at once, producing files from all of those threads and passing them into the, to the uh, file consumers. But we have some inefficiency here now. We've got seven threads producing content, but we have way more files running to, to run through than we do folders. So we definitely need to up, up this. So we can up this to 25. So we have 25 threads now that are going to run on the uh, uh, file name renaming. Run it. And we get about the same kind of thing. So this means that you can tune it and uh, kind of change the different pieces of this um, to say different parts need more or less. If we decide that 25 is a little excessive because we don't have that many cores, we could tune that down to like 15 or 10 or something like that. Um, and if we really want to, and we know that we're on a really slow computer that doesn't have enough cores to really handle this, we can just go ahead and make this single threaded on all these and only run three, only run one of each type of thread and it still runs completely fine, does the exact same thing with just fewer threads of each. So, the, uh, the takeaways from that is that uh, the threads that are actually doing the work are started before anything is even supplied. So you could think about this in terms of like serverless programming, which is the, the new hotness these days. So you have functions in Azure Functions sitting there just waiting for different work to come to it. Think of a web server or something like that. This is kind of the same thing. You have these worker threads sitting there waiting for work to come through it. And it's kind of like a parallel pipeline of sorts or a concurrent pipeline where you're passing information from one command to the next, but instead of using the pipeline, you're using these queues to talk between multiple threads. And you can increase and decrease the number of threads running of each type. So in our original uh, thread, uh, original pipeline of uh, producer consumer pattern with the get, um, get job, wait job, and receive job, think of this as running, uh, <laughs> seven get jobs at once and uh, 25 wait jobs at once and one receive job at once. So it's kind of like if we could split that out and have it doing multiple work at once, it's working kind of the same way. Um, you can have also more file producers than you actually have folders. So going back to our original, we had three and five to start. Oh three and five to start. So we have seven folders, but what happens if we do 17 file producers, right? Is that going to break anything? No, it's going to run fine. The, uh, some of those threads will end up doing nothing and the queues will just, once the queue gets ended, completed, they'll say, oh, well, you know, it's just like when you do for each on null, it just does nothing. It, it ends the for each, but this just happens to sleep those threads for you automatically, so you don't have to do anything. And uh, so we can have more than we need for the intake, and it won't break either. And then Again, we had the single log consumer to prevent file locks, but we use the same pattern because we could change this to using something like SQL, which can work with multiple inputs at once and not be an issue. So that's the producer consumer pattern um, in PowerShell concurrent programming. Uh, you can find the material, I linked it in the Skype chat for this, uh, but it is on my GitHub under the concurrent PowerShell producer consumer repo. And check out my blog at getpowershellblogblogspot.com and you can find me on Twitter at, at Marky Kraus. So if there's any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to take them at this point.
So can the file producer add to the folder queue? It could. So you could um, add to a queue that you are processing on, um, and that's totally fine, assuming that you use the right methods for doing that. Um, you want to be careful, though. If you are in a situation where you have, uh, let's say you want to retry, that's probably where we're going with that. Um, if you want to retry, the better pattern is to take your same exact type of thread that you need to retry on and create a new uh, uh, sibling section for that and create a retry queue that those use instead. So you can reuse the same exact code, but instead of processing off your primary queue where things go the first time, it goes to a retry queue. Because you probably want fewer retry threads, um, and uh, that would be a better pattern to use. Uh, the reason why is that if you get in a situation where you have the same thing that is consuming things from a queue as it is adding to a queue, you can get into infinite loops that are in really hard to troubleshoot. One thing to mention about doing this pattern with the raw run spaces is that unless you're Kirk Monroe, you are going to have a really hard time debugging these. So I, I would, uh, uh, you have to use a lot of logging to do that, and um, you're probably going to run into a lot of contention issues at first. Yeah, so you could have a different producer thread. Um, since I was doing it from the, the main running thread, you could have a different producer thread that was responsible for creating folders. Um, so you could do it in two stages. You're given a list of top-level folders, and then you have a first queue that goes through and enumerates all the subfolders in that folders and adds them to a second queue, and then that queue would be fed into the file uh, the yeah into the uh, file producer thread, which would then be consuming the folders from the previous one. So it's better to think about chaining these together and just, instead of having the same thread writing back to the queue that it's consuming. Any other questions, comments, feedback, hate mail? So, do you, and I posted that in there. That's something that I saw from Lee Holmes uh, about, a, I guess, about a week ago, and it was after after uh, you sent me your synopsis and all that sort of stuff, I was like, because I'd never heard of this before, and I was like, wow, that's that's like two times I've heard of this within <laughs> like two weeks. You know, I, I have not, but looking at this, it looks very similar. Um, so, yeah, I, the thing is that uh, this pattern is, as I said, I adopted it from C Sharp and .NET. So it's a common pattern in, in that space, and since PowerShell is a .NET language, it, it was really easy to adopt in. So it's not surprising that somebody else discovered I hadn't seen it. That's really neat. I, I need to read through his, his uh, blog entry on that, because when I was looking at this, I, I didn't find anybody else that was really doing it at the time. Yeah, and same here. I'd never heard of it before, and I know you sent me your information like, like maybe a month ago, and I kind of held on to it, and I said, well, I'm going to publish it like a week ahead, you know. And I wanted to wait till after the long weekend so nobody forgot about the meeting. But anyway, <laughs> then a couple of days after I published your information, I saw that from Lee, and I'm like, you know, is there something something going on in the PowerShell community that I, I haven't heard about with the, all of this? Yeah, no, I'm I'm hoping that this kind of takes off because, like I said, the the pattern that I see most often used is the batching process, and it's not bad. And if you're going to do things quick and simple, that is definitely the way to go. Um, but when you start getting to some scale issues, like dealing with 17,000 mailboxes that have anywhere between two and three million rules on them, that's a that starts to be like a real pain point to try and batch that out in any way that makes sense. 
You know, it's kind of funny you use that as a uh, as a scenario because I have that exact scenario that what you described earlier is what I have. You know, we were talking before the meeting about Office 365, mm -hmm. and I have Exchange 2010 in a hybrid in hybrid mode with Office 365, and we're in the process. We're moving our corporate accounts to to Office 365 this year, and then we're a franchise-based business, and next year we'll be moving all our franchise accounts to Office 365. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's becoming a pretty uh, common scenario. The, the, that stack is, is going wild with enterprises at this point. So Sid asked, what's it like working at LinkedIn? And uh, it's awesome. I see one of my colleagues, at least in the uh, in the chat. So that's that's good. No, it's it's really awesome. Um, yeah, there's Nicholas chiming in. Uh, I love it so far. It's great. It's been the uh, uh, it's been an amazing experience so far. It's a great company to work for. Great culture. Um, and if you are an experienced technologist and you're looking to make a career move and you're looking for your next play, uh, hit me up. There are a ton of jobs available at LinkedIn. It is an amazing employer to work for. Um, so, uh, and they're always looking for bright and experienced people. Um, there's not much available in, in my area, but there are plenty of jobs open. Are there any facilities to distribute the threads across machines? So the uh, messaging across machines um, is, uh, is something that you would do with, uh, with other kinds of inter-process um, inter queuing. So a good example of this is queue storage with Azure. So uh, there's some other things that I forget what it's called. Everyone always brings it up, but there's some uh, Microsoft one that you can run. Um, and then there's uh, like something from Redis, I believe, some kind of Redis queuing. But basically, these are services that are, are made for um, inter-machine queuing and inter-process queuing. Um, so you could signal between threads and message between threads with some kind of queuing mechanism. Uh, you could potentially use remote uh, run spaces. Um, but the problem is that the queues that you are using in like the block, the threads, the thread safe collections, the block blocking collection of T and the concurrent queue, those are only local local uh, things. They do not uh, travel across to a remote run space, so it's not possible to pull anything off of those. Um, when you try to send that kind of collection over remote run space, it gets deserialized into the XML. Uh, CLI stuff and then resealized into an actual object on the other end that becomes pretty much useless, just like everything else that you send over a remote run space. So you would have to use some kind of external queuing mechanism to talk between that, but you can adopt a similar pattern um, as this, just not using those uh, .NET types. Yeah, MSMQ, that's the... Uh, I think that's the one that everyone brings up. I never used it. I'm I'm a little new to all of this kind of stuff, and I'm kind of a cloud first person at this place. So I've I've played a lot with the uh, Azure uh, queue storage, and I have to say that like tying that into Azure Functions and uh, the event hubs and all that kind of stuff to do all this amazing stuff is where I kind of got the inspiration for taking this into PowerShell in the first place. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a common model. So yeah, Mark is the last person we've got lined up this year, and uh, so we've got the next three months open. And so we're looking for some presenters, if you know anybody who's interested. Very cool. The Mike Shepard. 
another author from the uh, PowerShell conference book. Yeah. The book is, uh, I think the minimum price is currently $59.99, so $60. Yeah, there's a link. And the really neat thing about the book, all of it goes to uh, the on-ramp scholarship with the PowerShell Summit. On top of the fact that it's a book just brimming with awesome content from a lot of really talented PowerShell folks. Yeah, with the amount of content, the book really is, it might seem expensive, but it's really dirt cheap, and uh, I don't have a lot of sympathy for uh, people that say it's expensive after uh, just buying books for my daughter for college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember everyone was asking when we were going to make printed copies of this, and that's just a ridiculously large book if we were to do that. But yeah, you won't find the content anywhere else. Even the topic I wrote about, I have it blogged about, I've never spoken about. It's about uh, finding performance bottlenecks and I actually go through and use the performance counters and query on, on Windows systems and then I write a pester test and do infrastructure validation to make sure those performance count, the top 10 performance counters are within the specified limits. And not only do you, sometimes you have to, uh, it'll say like maybe you need 10% memory free. Well, it gives you the, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you how much is free. The performance counter doesn't. So you have to go query and find out how much memory you have. And then you have to calculate the performance counter with that to figure out if you actually have 10% available. But we have people like Thomas Lee, we've got Don Jones got a, has a chapter, Jeff Hicks, uh, pretty much it's the who's who of, of PowerShell books. Uh, Rob Sewell, um, people from Europe, people from the UK, pe people from the US, from Canada, we've got one guy from India. And it's all written in American English. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas, to answer your question, um, I believe all the ones that I presented on uh, do work in PowerShell Core. All I know that this core, this code that I wrote definitely does. Run spaces definitely work. Those .NET types are definitely available in PowerShell Core and .NET Core. Um, I don't know the level of compatibility that Posh RS Jobs has for Core, whether or not that's completely fleshed out, uh, but most of that is dealing with the PowerShell API, which really didn't change a whole lot between 5.1 and uh, 6.0, so it probably works just fine. Jobs definitely work. And then, as I said, PS Thread Jobs is um, going to be an actual uh, included part of PowerShell core, if it's not already. I'm behind on the times there. Yeah, I checked in uh, 6.04, and it's not in that version, although it may be in, in 6.1. Yeah, I know the, the, the plan, it was a really early RFC for PowerShell Core 2 to get concurrency running uh, in it. And, you know, it's been a long ask that there is a native way to do um, threads. And when we were at the PowerShell Summit, uh, Joey Aiello was talking about the they were deciding whether to use Posh RS jobs and just adopt it in kind of like how they did with Pester, um, or to use the PS thread jobs that Paul Hagenbotham wrote, um, who's on the PowerShell team. Um, I really like Bo Prox's module. Posh RS jobs is an amazing module. Um, however, it's a little bit dangerous once you start doing certain things because it does start copying context around and makes that really easy so that you can access like modules and, and variables and stuff that you already have and, and parent threads and stuff like that. 
but that starts to become a real pain point when um, you start doing things that are dangerous that you don't understand why they're dangerous, and you start getting a lot of thread locking. Um, whereas uh, PS Thread Jobs is awesome in that like everything runs in its separate context, and uh, it's separated out like that. That's painful because if you need to run modules, you know you have to import it into each individual run space and all that kind of stuff. So that that can be kind of uh, painful to deal with and variables aren't readily available. So it's a lot like running start job where you have to be cognizant of that it doesn't understand what's outside of its own context. Um, so pluses and minuses to that um, depends on uh, what your use cases are, but uh, both of those should work in core, I believe. And speaking of PowerShell Summit, the uh, call for, for topics is open uh, for the remainder of this month for next year. So um, if you have it already and you're interested in speaking, I would definitely submit uh, a session or two or three. Or 40. <laughs> Just <laughs> submit as many. And if you, if you think that uh, you can't um, present at these kinds of user groups like Mike's running or at the PowerShell Summit, um, I would recommend that you reconsider that. You have something that you know about PowerShell that others don't that would benefit from you sharing that. So definitely, um, if you're on the fence about starting to speak at user groups or at these conferences, uh, I would recommend tipping your hat towards speaking and giving it a shot. Because you do know something that others will benefit from. Yeah, and I know last year, the first few months, like January, February, maybe March, we had people do like dry runs of their presentations for the summit for our user group. And then what mm -hmm. we did, we we told people that we weren't going to record it, but we did, and then we just sat on the recordings until after the summit because there would be no reason to go to their session if, if we recorded it. But if anybody's interested in that, we'll be having a call for speakers for this user group as well. And at least initially, if you've never spoke before, it's a lot easier to speak virtually than it is in person. I'm a little out of the loop on what's been going on. Um, to give you some context, uh, for those of you who don't know, I was heavily involved in the web commandlets for the 6.0 release. I did a lot of work there. I did a lot of rework on the testing. I was really active. Um, but I've had to step back from my activity in the PowerShell core project in order to find a new job and then to relocate. So I'm a little behind on the times there on what's going on. If we have anybody else on the call that wants to uh, field that question, feel free to unmute. I mean, I'm running 6.04 on a Windows box, but I still primarily use Windows PowerShell. But when I write new code from this point forward, I run my code in both environments just to test it. Yeah. I know that we've got a new feature coming out for the web commandlets that has been a long time asked, and that is retry. Um, so you'll be able to retry uh, a site if you're getting a certain kind of error. Um, that's been a long ask. Fixed a decent amount of bugs that were introduced. Um, .NET, uh, you know, it's on it's on a newer version of .NET than 6.0 was, um, with uh, a bunch of bug fixes in that just uh, from the .NET, some huge performance games from that .NET upgrade. And my favorite piece is that underneath the hood of the web commandlets, the underlying .NET stuff, they uh, redid all of that to be very similar uh, across 
XSplat so that it's much more standardized, much more stable across all the different versions. So all the things that we had disabled on Mac OS, for example, um, those are now re-enabled because the web commandlets now support them. Um, so we've got better cross-platform support for the web commandlets in 6.1. Hey, with the uh, Active Directory commandlets, it was my understanding that they now work with PowerShell Core. Yeah, so in Windows 10, um, in one of the updates, what, what they've said at the last... Uh, uh, so they, they have a... Uh, what do they call it? The, the PowerShell Core Community Call. They have it on the third thir third Thursday of every month, I think, or something like that. Third Wednesday. I can't remember the day. Uh, but uh, at the last one, they were saying that they had completed a decent amount of work on on all the Windows modules. They had a very high number of commandlets available now in it. Um, so that'll come out in a Windows 10 update to be able to work with uh, with Core, but there is some definite work on that that's that's going to happen. Uh, we'll probably require a Windows 10 update. Windows 7 users are probably going to cry about that because um, it's probably not going to come to Windows 7 in its lifetime, which is short. Um, the uh, but in the meantime, there are several ways to work with AD from PowerShell Core, either using implicit remoting or the uh, PowerShell compatibility module, um, Windows compatibility module for PowerShell, rather. Uh, so there's, there's ways to, to work with it. Um, I agree that they are kind of, it's kind of a pain point. The AD one is a sticking one, and the PowerShell team has made that a pretty high priority. Um, they said that they pushed back work to to make that um, work. So that's going to happen for sure. Yeah, it looks like uh, 6.1 is in RC1 now, so it it's probably going to release soon. Yeah, and uh, if you if you have any time at all, I recommend getting the 6.1 just running some code on it, um, the, the current release candidate, and give it supplying feedback. That's the whole point of these uh, um, release candidates is so uh, you can test your stuff, make sure that it works, and um, make sure we haven't introduced any major bugs to it, and then, uh, then we can release. I just posted a link in about the uh, community call. It is on the third Thursday of the month, so they they can probably give you uh, the the really latest and greatest, most up to date information. And that let's see, so it'll be next Thursday on the twentieth. Yeah, and it's it's your chance to talk directly with the PowerShell team and uh, give them feedback and hear what the status is on PowerShell Core. Um, so it is uh, it is a true community call. It's not them just barking at us. Um, Yeah, and with the Active Directory commandlets, I use those a lot, and I can actually relate to uh, the implicit remoting with Active Directory commandlets leaves a lot to be desired because when you do implicit remoting with it, they it breaks a lot of the piping the commands together. Yeah, yeah. Um, you end up having to do your pipes inside of the invoke command script block instead of yeah, it's it's weird. There's yeah. <laughs> I had some implicit remoting stuff for AD at uh, 
the last job that I had to do. Um, basically, I created functions to abstract that out, and under the hood, it would call the pipeline inside the remote session and return the output back. Um, that's one way of doing it. Yeah, that's a pain point um, that everyone knows about for sure. Yeah. The, the number one new issue on on the GitHub for PowerShell cores, this doesn't support Active Directory. And we get a new one of those shows up like once a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, we know. You know we know. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't I've run into some of those problems where I've updated my RSAT tools with a new operating system. And then I didn't have the Active Directory command lit. So I was trying to use implicit remoting. So the good news is, is that uh, in the next iteration of Windows 10, RSAT is going to be a, uh, what do you call that, a, a feature on demand instead of a dif different package. And features on demand automatically update with the OS, so you yeah. don't have to worry about that stuff disappearing anymore. Very cool. So the, yeah. the bits will be on the hard drive, just not enabled by default. Um, yeah, well, I don't, I don't remember how all the features on demand. There's se several ways to, to do it, but um, yeah, I believe that's the case. It won't be a separate MSI, which is a good thing. Absolutely, and it won't be a separate MSI that you have to remember to reinstall after you update Windows, which is just painful. Yeah, there was some craziness with one of the most recent ones where you lost like either DNS or DHCP, and then you could actually go get the ones for the server and install that MSI and get those but you had to deinstall the Windows 10 ones first or some craziness. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah, there's some... I, I manage all those things. I do like all the back back end stuff. <laughs> I have to I have to say that uh the best thing about my new position is I don't have to deal with uh endpoint engineering and client engineering anymore. I do not miss doing Windows 10 stuff. It's uh, painful. Yeah, for the most, most part, I don't deal with the end users. Uh, I just do all the uh, server-related stuff. Usually if it's the end users, I'm like, hey, that's somebody else's job, you know. But uh, I'd, I deal with Exchange and SQL and Active Directory and everything else. But it, it ends up being a lot of fun because that way I'm not do I'm not like an assembly line worker. I'm not doing the same thing every day, and I get to uh, manage it all with PowerShell at least. Yeah, I'm getting to do what I consider my dream job. I'm using PowerShell to deploy Azure resources through a CI/CD pipeline. That is pretty awesome. We had a awesome demo today where we demoed our our CI/CD pipeline to our sister organizations. And uh, it was a great success. I've had a lot of fun on this project. It's awesome. It's best job ever. Thanks, Nicholas. Appreciate it. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you uh, presenting for us this month, Mark. And that this is something I've I've never even heard of this before. So it's something I'm going to have to research more. And that's the reason I really like recording these. We had one that I recorded last year, and it was something I was working on recently, so I went back and watched the recording, and it was like, it made so much more sense because I'd worked with it some. Yeah, I uh, I gave this presentation um, before, and a few months later, I had somebody who is a relative novice to PowerShell come and tell me that after looking through my source code on this and figuring out that they were able to take a process that was taking them days to run and it whittled down to minutes. So it's uh, somewhat approachable at least, um, hopefully, um, and it's definitely good. And I, I was really happy to speak here, and I'm glad I was able to bring something that's uh, kind of unique. <laughs>